afternoon and very warm welcome to all of you. So Simran has given us uh, an interesting topic, you know, decoding the future, how will digital marketing evolve in the AI era to, to influence the tech-savvy consumers. Thank God we still have real panelists to discuss this topic. And uh, uh, before we begin, uh, let's have a small quiz. Do you have an idea? Uh, what is the market size of AI in India? Can anyone guess it? So as per Statistica, it is $4 billion in 2023. That is roughly 3,200 crores. So that is approximately 3% of the total Indian uh, advertising spend of the country. And the market is growing at 18% CAGR. This is mind-boggling, mind you know, for a technology which is barely a few years old, you know. And that is why perhaps brands, media platforms, and agencies, they are spending huge amount, you know, uh, in AI enabling uh, technologies. And businesses like Accenture and HG, they have, you know, uh, they have also hired chief AI officers. And some of the metaverse experts have also, you know, reinvented themselves and now calling them as, uh, you know, AI officers. And their compensation package, according to a study, is well above one million dollar. So uh, AI is not only, you know, gobbling up jobs, you know. Uh, so th that is why I think everyone wants to be at the forefront of, uh, you know, this revolution. And why is this so? Let us know from the experts. And Jyoti, my first question, you know, goes to you. You know, I would like to start, you know, uh, from you. Well, most of the businesses, they started talking about AI, you know, a couple of years back. But I think Tata Power uh, collaborated with uh, an AI firm, Blueware, in 2021, I guess, you know, in Mumbai. So I would like to, you know, ask you, how does it help, uh, you know, uh, to improve the prediction about consumer behavior and the market trends, especially for the Gen Z? So... Um so I think uh, the Blue Wave uh, integration and collaboration was more from a pure uh, business perspective initially. Like all new things, I think uh, it, it always starts from where it can show quick business impact. And Blue Wave, uh, what we do with Blue Wave is actually that it helps us to predict uh, power demand, forecast uh, consumer consumption patterns in energy. And also from the perspective of a regulatory uh, compliance that we have of onboarding renewable energy, right? So it came less from a marketing and actually more from a business perspective. Uh, it helps us to understand consumer patterns and hence uh, to predict how to optimize our power purchase uh, through the day uh, and optimizes the power purchase cost, right? So that's the blue wave uh, collaboration. Uh, what it has additionally helped to do and how the, how the industry has evolved from there on uh, from a consumer perspective is that if you look at uh, smart energy meters, right, which give the consumer the power to uh, optimize their own energy consumption by looking at patterns. And as marketeers, what it allows us to do is to really understand how is it that they are consuming uh, power uh, and it seems very mundane, but actually then I, I will know, for example, uh, whether you are using one AC or two AC, when did you use your washing machine? So it gives me really deep insights into their uh, appliance usage patterns within the household. And that's valuable data then to really how to, uh, to understand them and to build our business on. So, so it starts from business, then it goes into consumer insights, and hence into further use cases on how we can uh, really build business impact and not just use it like a, you know, like a new tool which is good to experiment with, but uh, eventually takes much longer to build a use case. Yeah. So there are brands like you know Tata Power, you know, we, who have been proactive in using AI, but there are certain brands which are still apprehensive. Uh, so my question uh, to you, Aditi, do you think that marketers and brands will sooner or later realize that they cannot, you know, get away from this uh, uh, revolution? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I think the AI, so there's a word AI hype cycle. I think AI is here to stay and uh, the more we recognize that and more we make friends with it, I think that's a, a, 
of the best way of looking at it because what it does it it unlocks so much of opportunity if you use it right like jyoti just mentioned saying how do you start with data and then move into consumer insights and then unlock it uh, ai has been around for the last 6 7 years uh, as we've been using it as in the form of assistance we've been using it in form of machine learning optimizations everything that uh, you know we've been doing uh, largely towards either automation or towards uh, optimization and lower funnel activities in marketing well, that's what we usually term them as but i think w and that's been uh, what we call as performative ai now with generative ai that opened up last year i think the real power gets unlocked is when you stack the two together and you actually start talking top of the funnel how can you re reach different audiences with messages and targeting that is relevant to them so how do you convert all of the data and all of the insights into your messaging strategy and reach out and ai allows you to have that in a very efficient manner however yes you need the guardrails you need the frameworks in place for the right use of ai and i think that's where the uh, bit of lag is coming because it is so new everybody is trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong uh, as soon as that learning curve has been crossed i really see the use cases of ai expanding more and more as people become more familiar with it yeah deepak uh, i would like to know from you how are you leveraging you know ai technologies you know in getting insights for the gaming sector it's so uh what ai does right so one ai is not new to the world of gaming uh, ai existed uh, for ages back i don't know if you remember the game uh, pac man i'm sure most of us have played the ghost if you remember right so that that was the f one of the first initial uh, ai generated uh, 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 module right so so it it has grown it has grown it has made it more immersive it has made it more interactive and it has helped create very extreme immersive experiences right so the gaming today is a extended you right that's your alter ego uh, it's you who's willing over there if the intent to win and the ai is now enabling lot of interaction lot of uh, 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 experiences and it's also helping you stay longer right it is also helping you play for much longer time and also it's helping you i mean as an advertiser to push uh, uh, ads to you without you realizing what you have just uh, stepped on right so that's so uh, uh, that's how ai is helping gaming and uh, the what we have seen and what you will see in, in the coming year uh, the gaming would be as real as uh, you being part of it uh, ar vr would add up to uh, take you to the absolute uh, next levels yeah thank you deepak and ruby uh, because you are a martech expert uh, and of course i think you are handling a couple of brands you know in scaling up their their uh, marketing propositions so it would be interesting to know you know how ai enabled technologies are helping them helping brands to improve their communication strategies yeah so on the martech space uh, there is a marketing angle and there is a technology which boosts the marketing so and you will also hear a lot of people saying okay there are marketing driven ai use cases and there is technology specific use cases but if you really see acquisition angle of the right consumers and understanding them and then finding more the use cases practical practically deployable use cases today i can go in a sequence like the number one is digital assistant you will see chatbots in almost every next application introduced so that you need to reduce a uh, number of people who respond to a chat opening it could be automated number one use case second would be you know it infrastructure optimization we need lesser machines to deploy the service faster then you will see automation is a area where marketing and technology side is gaining huge efficiency and benefit with ai other angle which is smarter angle says you will see now the call centers are uh, ai ai managed you will see a a real voice almost feeling real voice coming from the other side but the person is you know not a normal iq person will relate okay the person is not real and then other use cases like fraud detection and then after that is threat detection if you are maintaining a launch or maintaining like a strong tight competition space threat detection preventing it is is strong also in area of proper sales funnel optimization it's a huge huge pick up there and qc regular audits now can be automated and if you see if you are launching a game you need to deploy scalable infrastructure now it can be done by a click 
earlier you needed like a huge IT team to keep on scaling instances behind it. So that's, I would say, in the right sequence, practical as of today, deployed use cases. But I would say in the marketing sweetening angle top of it, yes, ideation is getting automated. You can use image to, you know, text to image to get ideas, like image in from Vertex AI, you can see it's really changing the game of how fast you can have ideas to put in creatives. Also, you can create creatives on demand, huge variations. The modeling can make the creatives intelligence on the go, which means lesser turnaround time to change campaigns and all. So performance is improving, and I see AI as an extension of efficiency that you can bring in. That's a larger lens to this, and it's already happening in these use cases. And I would say most money is right now in these use cases. After that is a lot of thinking and trying happening, but this is all the way us being a uh, professional services provider, we deploy these as of today. And after that, a lot of experiment, let's try that, let's do that. But this is, as of today, is gaining a lot of returns already to all advertisers. Really interesting perspective. Now moving on to the second round. And Jyoti, I'll start with you again. So how can we unlock new avenues in hyper-personalization, you know, using AI, especially when, you know, privacy uh, laws are becoming, you know, more and more stringent globally and also in India? So I think personalization and hyper-personalization is already happening. And I think Rubir will, um, you know, back that up for me from his experience mm -hmm. and data perspective. Where I think the whole AI and the Gen AI story comes in is that uh, it, it will allow for uh, actually, like Deepak was saying, immersive experiences to be created, not only in gaming, but actually from a brand perspective also. Right? And that's where the value unlock will happen. Uh, the, the other bit is that there will be, uh, from privacy perspective, I think Indians are probably the most lax when it comes to uh, you know, being open to sharing our data. We all think, okay, I clicked the X and didn't leave you know, a cookie, but if you're online, you know, I think the net knows you better than you do yourself. Right? And that's a reality that we all have to live with. What is happening, however, is that this whole thing about responsible AI and the data frameworks that are now you know, being worked upon, uh, we are moving towards this concept of privacy by design, not just you know, putting a guardrail, but privacy by design, which actually keeps the end user at the center of it uh, while uh, allowing for innovation to happen because you know if we uh, if we don't allow for those spaces then no technology innovation will ever happen also so these are conflicting uh, things that we are today playing with and it is likely to happen with every uh, technology that uh, you know is is in the emerging space uh, as as marketeers i think it's our uh, our responsibility and our job to ensure that uh, we try to give as much information to the end user as we can to allow them to make an informed choice uh, and to ensure that uh, you know we use the data for the purpose that we take permission from the user for so this whole thing of purpose limitation of storage limitation in terms of how long will we preserve the data and what end use we will put up put it up to and whether it is really useful for the uh, for the person who's sharing their data or only for us. I think these are sort of the guiding principles which uh, will eventually lead to where this technology goes and how much it scales up. Otherwise, you know, we've seen enough and more instances of various kinds of technology coming up and then also falling by the wayside and not really being adapted and adopted by consumers because consumers, I think, understand it much faster than marketeers do. And we are always, you know, just trying to play catch up with, with them. So that's, that's my view on it. Yeah, true. In Deepak, I would like to have your point of view on this. So, uh, I think privacy is a big concern, you know, even consumers are aware. Yeah, so, see, uh, in a digital world, right, so you're there for a reason, right? But in gaming, you're on a mission. And when you're on a mission and your quest is to win, you are willing to leave a lot of footprints, right? Now, it's up to the game creator, right, as to how he wants to use the data. Knowingly or unknowingly, if you look at the game that you're playing, right, you are getting stuck at certain level, it will itself give you direction as to how you need to move out of it, right? So today, the games are getting personalized. Basis uh, a predictive analysis it's in telling you how a, cons a gamer is performing and where he or she is getting stuck, how it can be outmaneuvered. 
or you'll have the option of playing the game and it'll say, okay, skip this level and go to the next and then come back over here. Right? They want you to stay. They want you to be over there. And like uh, 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 we just uh, uh, mentioned, you know, that you're being tracked whether you know it or not. Now it's up to you uh, how much footprint you want to live and as a company as to how much you want to use it effectively. Right? So you can use that uh, uh, hyper-personalization in terms of how to push sales, uh, right? Because you know how he or she behaves and responds uh, uh, to, uh, to, a, uh, to a particular situation. Aditi, how, what is Lenovo doing on this? On hyper-personalization? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have, like Jyoti just mentioned, there are a lot of frameworks and guidelines. So we are still sort of looking through that. Uh, before we get into a hyper-personalization uh, situation, right, uh, uh, using anything for hyper-personalization. Uh, but having said that, I think one of the most interesting cases in hyper-personalization has been uh, the Cadbury, not just a Cadbury ad that happened recently, right, uh, where you take the information and really use a celebrity like Shah Rukh Khan to give uh, a, a platform to the local stores. Uh, and that really connects because, okay, oh, I need this store. The store is never going to have Shah Rukh as their brand ambassador, but I think Mondelez is really uh, nicely connected the two together to build that. So something like that where you really have the, uh, and if you flip this other side, so this was more from the shopkeeper side. Now tomorrow, if you have the hyper-personalization data and then you go to an e-commerce uh, site, and then you use the first party data in a cookie-less world, that's going to become more important. And how do you then give them the recommendation, the right uh, matchups, use them, use it to upgrade? That is going to be a very interesting journey to see when you use uh, the uh, information that you have, you personalize the messaging that you reach them. And because any product that you have will have multiple use cases. Right now what happens is you, because of budgets, because of whatever other constraints, you limit to one generic message, at least at top of funnel for everybody. With hyper-personalization, you can unlock that, right? Within, staying within your privacy frameworks. So I think that's going to be something that's interesting. And with what is your point of view? As a market, market company, uh, what kind of, you know, technological solutions you are providing to brands for hyper-personalization and also uh, to keep the pri privacy of the data? So I think one thing which will get really super relevant soon is consent management system. So consenting on first party and third party space, and now you will hear a lot of zero party space, will increase a lot. Earlier you will, as of today, you will see a lot of just a single notification comes on the website, accept cookies or not accept, that will zoom a lot. You will see accept, specific, essential, only all other combinations and then you reject it. So consent will pick up as the technology requirement, and that will be a top-up technology of whatever websites, apps you build. You would need to maintain consent, ask for it, and respect for it. After that, hyper-personalization, which we any which ways do as we are progressing, we had a lot of human intervention already. That will reduce by usage of AI. If you see on a third-party space, you will see if you, if you visit an insurance website, you will probably ask for a quote. The ad creative will chase you with the same quote. Uh, but the ad creative's background or the celebrity and the, and the color combinations will almost stay same. So the, the change will move towards, if the user has not consented, the background of the creatives and other combination of the creatives will dance a lot, but the quote will go away slowly as uh, the browsers are picking up on sunsetting the third party cookie space. So obviously there is uh, a lot of browser aligned APIs being tested to support some privacy safe way to still do the same thing. But I see in the first party space, by using AI, huge acceleration will happen in hyper-personalization because in first party space, mostly we just do A-B testing with 10 variations. But now, after proper consenting in first party space, you can create unlimited variations. Really, truly, uniquely personal website journey. Yeah. You will visit a page, next time you will come back to the same page, not the home page. Even if you attempt to change the home page, it will show you the same thing, start the journey from there, and keeping optimized. So that, I believe, it will, Personalization will decelerate a bit uh, in 3P space, but accelerate a lot in 1P space. And AI will be used to bridge the gap uh, with what we lose in 3P, I believe. But consent management is supposed to be, I would say in six months time, India will just talk about that a lot. 
Yeah. yeah. It's very important, right? So moving on to the third round, and I'll again, you know, go to Jyoti. Uh, so I would like to know how is AI driving the conversational marketing these days? So AI has actually been the primary driver of all conversational marketing for the last many years now, right? <clears throat> uh, it, is, it, it is that uh, initially, uh, I think the experiences that we created for users were probably not as optimal as the, as the user would want. Uh, also tech savviness grows, consumers also learn. Uh, but uh, I, I hear a lot uh, that uh, experiences with chatbots have usually not been great, right? And this is across. And then came in the conversational marketing and the conversational commerce and conversational bots, and things have changed, right? And it is, it is improving because the capabilities have gone up, the, the learning uh, models which are used have become far more complex and advanced. And today, uh, there's, there's a lot of industries which are now very successfully uh, experimenting and have moved to the next level also. Uh, I, I see uh, most B2B to uh, start adopting this in a much deeper manner. Um, hospitality is, is one example where it can actually provide a very, very uh, deep and uh, personalized kind of experience. Uh, it, it may not work as well probably for, you know, the, the more mass B2C products, but wherever there is personalization required, it, it will improve. And today the conversational commerce space is a very, very fast growing space and it's set to become like a multi-billion uh, dollar economy over the next five to six years. So that's what's happening in this space today. And it is it will be powered by uh, generative, performative, uh, and whatever else will come next. Yeah. Deepak, have you observed, you know, uh, similar transformation in gaming sector as well? Yeah, so uh, I think it works very nicely in, in a gaming segment because uh, you are out there uh, for a kill and a prompt that comes in and, uh, and, uh, and that comes in to help you move to the next level, you are willing to buy. Right now, there are two ways uh, you can look at it. One, uh, from creating a, a, a seamless experience. And second, in terms of uh, uh, inducing commerce as, uh, you know, as a, uh, uh, inducing commerce to enable uh, you move to the next level. Right, so uh, uh, this has led to a lot of personalization as to when the gamer comes, uh, comes on and, and is uh, 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 participating in the game as to how, as to how uh, it can help you achieve, uh, uh, get to the next level. Uh, number two, uh, how, because the game, uh, the company understands how a gamer behavior or uh, or how he uh, play time is right so you are able to push certain messages or prompts to get him to uh, stay hooked on to the game for much longer right so uh, both in terms of commerce and experience i think it's it's doing a, a great uh, great job yeah aditi on uh, conversational marketing yeah. i think what is happening is as assistants and chatbots are getting far more intelligent because what is helping is uh, like jyoti mentioned initially when when he started with the chatbots you would go to a roadblock because it was a programmed chatbot and it had only those three or four options i think one of the biggest thing is the whole uh, growth in natural language processing and that coming into chatbots where you can now go beyond the first four whatever's programmed and as the chatbot is getting more and more information more and more learning is happening and it is able to provide a lot more um, a lot more refined answers to your questions right and a lot of that now gets automated because once you have plugged in that ai component of it you don't need to feed in the data you plug it into your uh, back end and then the chatbot can throw up the right answer that is uh, required. So I think that nature, I'm not too sure how um, assistants are moving because I think there is still a little way for assistants uh, to come but yes voice will get bigger because we've seen voice has a far bigger role to play uh, in India. Uh, but chatbots uh, are becoming more and more refined. You can take a whole journey from uh, engagement to, uh, you know, uh, transaction, right? Uh, 
I've seen hospitals use it in terms of converting it to a consultation uh, appointment and you start and you say, okay, I want to ask for XYZ query, this is a thing, okay, this is the doctor that you need to meet, these are the ones available, so it will take you right up to a consultation. I think Apollo has uh, something like this, right? So it's going to be interesting on how to, how, how much data at the back end you're plugging in and how the chatbot can then efficiently, uh, you know, use it, thereby also then reducing some of the uh, tele uh, rules that you have the, the uh, processes there and freeing up that space for answering more developed queries uh, over there, which re require human intervention. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's extending on Aditi's argument. I mean, Ruvir, can you please, you know, also share some, some case studies or some use cases, you know, where brands have actually, you know, they have got, you know, better sales. In sales? Yeah. Yeah, I think in sales, if you use assistance or chatbots, uh, we actually use it on our website. It, it helps the user to first do a proper mental and self-discovery. What do you need? A lot of time you have a problem, but you don't know which technology will solve it. And let's say if we are, if we are technology provider and, you know, professional services provider, we use it and many of our customers use it to help the incoming party first realize what exactly the person will need with a series of right probing questions, which will help the person go in the right direction and narrow down to the area. And that actually helps sales to reduce the discovery meetings right away. If you just copy paste it to all kind of use cases like for hospitals and you know other services is mainly making the user realize and explain its need in natural language and then help it get narrowed down to an area which it, which it resonates well with. And then somebody at advanced level can get in and then do a further conversation to close it or maybe make the person realize, yes, we have the service or not have the service. And that reduces the knowledge transfer time. That reduces the sales time. That reduces the turnaround time. That sales, saves the sales teams you know, time to, to actually go and pick already matured conversation. And you know, most of the leads in any sales cycle is just knowledge. I'm curious, do you do this? And that education is completely taken over by, by solutions like this. Yeah, really interesting, yeah. So moving on to the fifth round, and Aditi, I'll come back to you again. So we often talk about, you know, uh, reducing attention span of Gen Z and millennials, and how most of them, you know, prefer to skip the ads, or maybe uh, they use uh, ad blockers. So, I, and how can then we effectively, you know, reach out to Gen Z and millennials? Uh, I think the key thing about Gen Z is, right, uh, this is an audience that wants authenticity, they want relatability, they do not want to be spoken to, they don't want to be sold to. So you need to really have that approach when you're talking to uh, Gen Z. Uh, what we are doing uh, at R and at Leno is trying, look, looking at a mix of both generative and, uh, so we use Google Performance Max tools to be able to cull the right message, create the right um, image and messaging that is there, create that uh, marriage between uh, the uh, messaging and uh, this, create various options of it, multiplicity of it, put it into the performance max tool with key goals in terms of who is the person that we are trying to reach to. It's not just the demographic audience, right? It's more than that. It allows you to define the personality. It allows you to be more specific in the nature of person you want to try to reach and what is the use of the, uh, uh, the product that you are selling. So what are the use cases? What? And then that coupled with the fact that, you know, you have multiple creatives, you have uh, been able to provide multiple copy. It, the machine then optimizes and reaches out. So then when as a consumer, as a Gen Z person, I'm seeing it, I have three seconds, or now possibly it's even lesser. I know a couple of years back it was three seconds, now I think it may be just a second or second and a half, right? In that one nanosecond, I have to be able to stop the person, right? So that visual, that message has to catch my attention to be able to stop it. And it has to be in a non-intrusive space for them to be able to accept the message. So how do you take it into a native kind of a conversation? So is it influencer? Is it uh, like uh, Deepak just mentioned, is it games? Are you, you know, present in the place where they are in game? Uh, 
uh, right? So then you look at the place, message, getting the message and the place right is going to be really the key to win over this audience. So Deepak, when, when we, uh, you know, talk about Gen Z and millennials, so we are basically talking about 50% of the population. But when it comes to gaming, I think this population is much more. Uh, so I would like to know how exactly you are trying to reach out to consumers when they are using, you know, escape ads and ad blockers. Right, so in gaming, you can't have, a, you know, stall moment because an ad popped up and it's extremely intrusive. And as a gamer, you may just, you'll be putting off your, uh, the consumer and may or may not come back to the game ever again. Right, so how do you tackle this? Right, so some of the uh, thing that I'm sure most of us would be familiar with, those L band, right, uh, that would have seen uh, during the cricket matches. Those are some of the very uh, prevalent and normal things for you to do. Uh, second, if you look at, there are uh, possibilities of in-game uh, advertisements, right, which are non-intrusive and passive. So you can have both passive and active uh, 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 game uh, integrations. So in the passive, so if you play uh, any of the car racing game, like uh, Asphalt 9, if you, anyone of, are hooked onto it, right, so there are those uh, billboards, signages, right, which can be there, which acts as an ad, but it's not creating any diversion. Second is, as the, when the game is being developed, right, at that point of time as part of a narrative, your script, right, you have infused that, you know, you need to get into a, a, a bizzlery outlet, consume a bottle of water, and then move to the next, right? That's part of your game. A consumer would never skip that because he's gonna earn goodies, right? In Asphalt 9 or a car race game where you need to, uh, you know, uh, pick up NOS, right? So we're saying, you know, consume this and you will get a chance. So as long as it's inclusive, it's not disrupting the game. Uh, it is not creating any unnecessary irritation. I think consumer will bite it, right? So there are those reward ads, right? So they'll make you watch a video. I mean, that's fine if, if it's a casual game, but if it's a competitive game, right? Uh, it's a team play, then you would, would, I mean, that doesn't really work. As Deepak rightly mentioned about, you know, being non-intrusive. And uh, Jyoti, I would like uh, to know from you, uh, how does Tata Power approach this issue? How do you approach, uh, you know, anti-age, anti-ad population? <laughs> so I think Gen AI is Gen Z, right? They are, uh, there's, there's some recent Salesforce survey which says that 70% of Gen Z uses Gen AI and they think that it helps them live better. It helps them be more organized. I think contrary to what their parents think, that's what they think. And that it helps them get a lot more out of their life. They're also this very, you know, instant gratification generation, immediacy. I want it like now. So uh, it's, it's something which you have to keep in mind when we are dealing with them and when we are trying to reach out our messages to them. So like Deepak said, immersiveness is very important. They, they are like an experienced generation, but experience everything instantly. Uh, I'll just take an example. Uh, it, it's not necessarily data-based, but it's something where we created a character using Gen AI. And this is a character which we call Globy. So we launched a sustainability-linked campaign at Startup Hour last month, uh, where we spoke about dunya uh, apne hawale, you know, collective and individual action to, uh, towards a greener future and protect our planet. And we wanted to, uh, you know, reach this message in a very impactful manner to younger audiences, because otherwise, like, oh, sustainability is something which gets talked about at panels and in fancy conferences and at DevOps and at COP and all. And it's not something that's, that's me. Or even if it is, I don't know what to do about it. And interestingly, Gen Z actually wants a more sustainable world. They probably just don't have enough say in things right now to be able to, you know, take action. So we created this character called Globy, which is a representation of the Earth. It was created completely using Gen AI. We converted it into comics and put it out in social media. But I think the one thing which does not go away, whether we, whether we are Gen Z or whatever generation we are, is the power of the human touch and how Gen AI and human intelligence. So, you know, we call it AI and HI, how AI and human intelligence can work together. So we took this character actually into uh, a real form, yeah, and we took it to activations and we took it on ground and we had the character mingle with children, with youth, and it just created immense amount of traction. Yeah, so we are now planning to take it much bigger because it's given us confidence that this, this collision of 
um, using AI-powered uh, methods and uh, what the human intelligence tells you to do and these emotions and values, when they come together, that is when we can actually create much, much bigger value as marketers for our consumers. I think Jyoti made a very pertinent point in AI power and human touch. And Rubir, I would like to know from you, what kind of challenges you face, you know, from, from the consumer side? Yeah, for, for us consumers, basically our enterprise companies and SMBs we work with, the main challenge that we are being involved into is to do data centralization and using that data to signal first an uh, ad buying system, which is going to find the user. Second is then the, the ideation part of creative to be created personal level and then signaling the creative delivery system. What we need to solve in the short run is integration of these systems. Buying system needs to talk to the, the creative system and the creative system needs to talk to the game or the inventory or the location. And while all of this is happening, it has to happen in real time. And the, the crux of the knowledge of the first party data around the possibility of the user or some cases extended audiences, which is built, built on the small base, has to be so accurate and so real time. Infrastructure is the top ask right now. The tech is there, buying fast and delivery fast, but the intelligent system to talk in between all systems is where we getting a huge demand. You would hear about a world of CDP and data lake and centralization is where the top requirement is. I have all these systems purchased for different reasons, but right now they're talking too slow. We need to increase the speed so that they can go up to maximum scale. So that's the first challenge that we, we get hit into most of the conversations. Yeah, sure. So moving on to the fifth round. With AI, I think there is a lot of legal issues are also involved. We have seen ki how all the big tech, uh, you know, tech platforms like Google, Meta, and Microsoft, they are facing, you know, a lot of legal uh, cases in the U.S. and Europe. And uh, uh, we have also seen a lot of, you know, scams related to defects in India and also across the world. And besides, the huge costs are involved, you know, uh, when we want to invest in AI. Uh, so how challenging is it, uh, you know, to, to adopt AI at, at this point of time when there are huge costs are involved and at the same time the domain is, has, you know, legal uh, challenges? Uh, my question is to Aditi. Uh, I think uh, you have to be cautious while using AI, right? Uh, it is a new tool. I think all of us are learning around the tool as we, you know, try it out. Uh, unless we try it, we will not learn it. But having said that, use, having responsible AI, having ethical AI uh, is most crucial, right? And that for us at Lenovo is one of our focus points, saying it's not AI for the sake of AI. It's not a new... Uh, uh, new toy, new tool to just play with, but we have to be extremely careful and cautious on how we use it, where we use it, uh, simply because there is a lot of, there is risk involved uh, with using AI, uh, and we want to be very sure that we're using it in pertinent use cases. Uh, but if you don't use it, you will not know what it can do. So. Try it, tread carefully. Uh, as it evolves, I feel that all the frameworks will be in place, all the guidelines will be in place. It's similar to any new technology, right? Uh, when machines came out first, there was like a huge, oh, oh my God, uh, people are now used to machines. Uh, when computers came out, when, uh, inter when internet exploded and Google search happened, I remember uh, we were like, all our professors and all told us, no, no search, no search, you cannot use, it's copy pasting. And you know, there were tools to sort of weed that out, but now you use it on a daily basis because it helps you think deeper, it promotes critical thinking. So similarly, I think AI also is gonna have that learning curve. You will get familiar with it, you will know how to and how not to use it. So it's about going that journey step by step. Yeah, I think we have to move forward. Deepak, what is your point of view on this? Right, so see, uh, AI is not new to gaming, right? So I think it's, it's evolved, it's moved on, and it's at, at a certain stage where we need not worry about this. But of course, you always run the risk because there's always uh, uh, an element who may want to uh, deviate or digress from what needs to, uh, to do and what is right. 
Right, so what uh, AI has done in gaming is helping identifying uh, and trying to, uh, and avoiding similarities between the two game. Uh, so you know that uh, if game A is operating in certain manner, see, at all game operate in a similar manner only. I mean, if it's a shooting game, it's a shooting game. So only what you can change is the environment, right, and the gameplay. So that's what AI is helping enable that. So there is no duplication. There is, you don't go, I, I don't think we've ever heard about a copyright issue in gaming as yet because I think uh, this industry has matured over a period of, t uh, uh, of time of using AI eff uh, effectively. Uh, I think it's a matter of how, not a matter of if. We will all have to live with this and we will have to learn and navigate and uh, find the right uh, guardrails for our businesses and our consumers and the kind of data that we work with. That's where I think the world is going to go. Rubir? Yeah, I believe uh, AI right now and in the near future definitely will be used for a competitive edge against all competitors. So it will be used and it is being used. So if you slow it down in your preferences, it's your choice. But I would say on the cost part, if you are tra training a custom model for a unique personal need, training will be expensive. But the use case, if it is available in a wall garden or a trained model, just deploy it in, in a cloud instance and then just do a small personal training and it does the use case. It's very fast, it's not that expensive, but the gains and competitive that you get on stable models, it is worth the attempt to do. Obviously, taking care of all the ethical angles to it, but true customization is a bit expensive with lower accuracy and more time to burn, but stable use cases already trained in other part of the world, you just need to deploy and use it. Yeah. Yeah. Any question from the audience? Do we have any questions? <coughs> so, thank you everyone for you know taking time out and being part of this session. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.